All right, folks, last night, the Republican candidates running for president, except Donald Trump. Seven of them were on stage at the Ronald Reagan Library in Simi Valley, California. Uh, and a bunch of stuff was said, a whole bunch of shouting, yelling, screaming, a bunch of nonsense. Moderators could not control the debate. But there was one point where Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and Senator Tim Scott began to talk. And I don't know what the hell they were talking about, but I got to break this thing down, especially dealing with Senator Tim Scott. He should know better. Watch this. Which one of you? Florida's new black history curriculum says, quote, slaves develop skills which in some instances could be applied for their personal benefit. You have said slaves develop skills in spite of slavery, not because of it. But many are still hurt. For the sentence of slaves, this is personal. What is your message to them? So first of all, that's a hoax that was perpetrated by Kamala Harris. Uh, we are not going to be doing that. Second of all, that was written by descendants of slaves. These are great black history scholars, so we need to stop playing these games. Here's the deal. Our country's education system is in decline because it's focused on indoctrination, denying parents' rights. Florida represents the revival of American education. We're ranked number one in the nation in education by U.S. News and World Report. My wife and I, we have a six, five, and three-year-old. This is personal to us. We didn't just talk about universal school choice. We enacted universal school choice. We didn't just talk about parents' bill of rights. We enacted the parents' bill of rights. We eliminated critical race theory, and we now have American civics and the Constitution in our schools in a really big way, just like President Reagan asked for in his farewell address back in 1989. Florida is showing how it's done. We're standing with parents, and our kids are benefiting. Not, there is not a redeeming quality in slavery. He and Kamala should have just taken the one sentence out. America has suffered because of slavery, but we've overcome that. We are the greatest nation on earth because we faced our demons in the mirror and made a decision. So often we think that all the issues, you talked about crime and education and health care, we always think that those issues go back to slavery. Here's the challenge though. Black families survived slavery. We survived poll taxes and literacy tests. We survived discrimination being woven into the laws of our country. What was hard to survive was Johnson's Great Society, where they decided to put money, where they decided to take the black father out of the household to get a check in the mail, and you can now measure that in unemployment, in crime, in devastation. If you want to restore hope, you've got to restore the family, restore capitalism, and put Americans back at work together as one American family. Our nation continues to go in the right direction. It's why I can say I have been discriminated against, but America is not a racist country. Never, ever doubt who we are. We are the greatest country on God's green earth. Okay. I got... <laughs> Let me go to my guest first. David Pate, visiting associate professor uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, joins me right now. Uh, Doc, glad to have you on the show. There is so much that I, I, I'm about to deal with. Uh, I'm going to be real nice while you're here. I'm going to have my say uh, after the fact. So let's, let's, let's deal with Senator Tim Scott, starting with this. Oh, we survived slavery. Actually, no, no, no. I'm going to go before that. When he actually, in a very smooth way, tried to suggest that the ills that we still face today somehow do not have a connection to what happened during those 230 plus years as if you did not continue to have slavery without shackles for the 10 to 12 years of Reconstruction, the 92 years of Jim Crow. And so this notion that we cannot trace the economics, the education, health, all of that to what we went through then and after, he acts as if 
Oh, everything was just wonderful. We survived and we're thriving. Um, the devil's in the details, that's for sure. He's not acknowledging... The details or history book? <laughs> the history book and the details are both being denied here. You know, the one thing that, pull, that always gets me is people don't recognize that or don't want to recognize that those who came over and colonized this country had 500 years to be the best they can be. When one group of people weren't given citizenship rights to the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment to be the best they can be, and they've only had 150 plus years to do that. But we're, people are expected to ignore all of the atrocities and the discriminatory behavior that has followed even the, 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 the rights of citizenship uh, with the 14th Amendment. Um, so the, not acknowledging any of the history around the Homestead Act or the racial wealth gap or current median income or discriminatory practices is just ludicrous and not being honest. And not only that, and I'm going to come back to the Homestead Act because I want to play what MLK had to say about that. He talked about surviving poll tax. Literally, the day before the Republican right-wing Supreme Court refused to hear the emergency appeal of the state of Alabama who literally was trying to n destroy black representation by not creating a second congressional district the day before. And so when Tim Scott stands there and acts as if we still are not dealing with the after effects of white folks trying to deny the right to vote as if, oh, we survived that. Bruh, we were dealing with it the day before the debate. Yes, yes. And you know, the thing that's also interesting not interesting, when he said racism is gone, there was a study that just, just came out in November by the Pew Research Center that said two-thirds of America believes that racism still exists. And that included Democrats and Republicans. They may disagree on how racism plays itself out, but people believe racism still exists. Now, the other 30% of people who don't agree with that or whatever it is, um, the 35%, that's, that's a whole nother, that's where it, looks like Senator Scott's in that, that pool. But there is valid evidence that shows people believe it's there. They not, may not believe it's structural. They may believe it's individual. But, but racism is existing. And racism is in the soil of America, whether we want to admit that or not. Well, I think part of the deal here is that Tim Scott is sort of thinking and operating uh, like many white Christians uh, in this country. Uh, Anthony, go to my iPad. Uh, this is what you were talking about, Pew. White Christians say too many see racism when it's not there. New poll finds. To, so that poll poll you're talking about, other folks are saying, no, we see racism. Tim Scott is staying with the same white evangelical Christians right wing who say, we don't see it. Well, they don't feel it. <laughs> they not, it's not happening to them. So that's why they don't feel it. But it's there. And they know people know it's there. I mean, we don't want to admit that what our, how this country was defined, how this country's been built on the backs of people who were black or were enslaved. And they don't want to admit that we've had to have constitutional laws to make people full citizens. And it still is a consistent um, issue of concern for people who live in, the, particularly in the South, but all over America, even in Wisconsin, this issue of having to have your ID to go vote is a real issue of looking at a poll tax in a different way. It's still a poll tax. It still, it still has the tenets of what a poll tax is, because not everybody has a driver's license, particularly when you you're in a state like Wisconsin, where you have the highest level of black male incarceration, and oftentimes it's hard to get that driver's license to get your ID to be able to vote. So there's, there's various other ways that are not always as visible, but they, yep. still are, uh, they still are providing the same practice of, I do not see you as my equal. Yep. I see you as less than, and I support that in whatever way that maintains my position of superiority. You mentioned MOK. You mentioned the Homestead Act. Uh, and this is the MOK uh, Republicans are never going to repeat. Uh, they love talking about content of character and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but you're never going to hear them play this MLK quote at any of their events. And to be honest with you, not many black folk will do the same. Go to my iPad, Anthony. At the very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land, through an act of Congress, 
our government was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that it was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. But not only did they give the land, they built land-grant colleges with government money to teach them how to farm. Not only that, they provided county agents to further their expertise in farming. Not only that, they provided low interest rates in order that they could mechanize their farms. Not only that, today many of these people are receiving millions of dollars in federal subsidies not to farm, and they are the very people telling the black man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. Now, At the Doc, very here's what I find time, interesting, Doc. You heard M.O.K. Uh, in that uh, very uh, uh, speech there talk about uh, land-grant uh, colleges and universities. Um, next Tuesday in Tennessee, uh, the students there are going to be holding, and I'm going to show it in a second, students there are going to be holding um, uh, an event, uh, a town hall there, uh, demanding the billions of dollars that they are owed. Uh, the Biden administration sent letters, Cardona and Vilsack sent letters to various states saying $13 billion is owed to HBCUs who were shorted over the years land grant money. Go to my iPad. This is the rally at Tennessee State is going to be having uh, on Tuesday, October 3rd, 2023. So here you have Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina standing there talking about how we survived and here we are in 2023 still talking about those very institutions MOK mentioned, those land-grant schools being deprived of $13 billion, but on the end, Tim Scott saying, oh, there's no racism in America. Well, Tim, how is it the black colleges didn't get the same money as the white schools? You know, the, the issue here is that we, if we maintain an anti-black way of life, which is very prominent in society, we're never going to, you're, no one's going to, we're not going to receive the same level of respect, the same level of, su of support. Um, you know, it just is it's all about this whole idea that meritocracy is the basis for how everything works, but not everybody is given <laughs> the same level of access or the same level of privilege to be able to maintain and uh, get to what we consider um, the, the American dream, but also the level of of um, well-being that they deserve, because we have to admit there's this, there's a discomfort with blackness, and 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 so many studies have just brought that up more recently. Studies by William Darity, by Derek Hamilton, by Trina Shanks, all well-known scholars, and even Raj Chetty most recently did a study uh, out of Harvard where he looked at people who had the same income, high incomes, who are black and brown and white still you will find that there's discriminatory practices that do not allow for those who are black and brown to still maintain the same level of parity as their white counterparts. There's a, we, have a, we have a discomfort with blackness, and that, and that needs to be acknowledged, and, and that's and, not what's being talked and, about. And there are black people who have a discomfort with blackness who are trying to appease and make certain white folks comfortable, and that's literally what... Uh, Sir Tim Scott was doing. Go to my iPad. Uh, this is from the InsideHigherEd.com. And this is from their story uh, last week on HBCUs being underfunded. And so here's what I find to be interesting right here, Doc. If you look at this chart right here, when they broke down the analysis, Tennessee, uh, $2.1 billion. North Carolina, $2 billion. Florida, $1.9 billion. Texas, $1.1 billion. Uh, West Virginia, $852 million. Georgia, Six hundred and three million. Alabama, five hundred twenty-seven thousand. Boom, Doc. South Carolina, four hundred and sixty-nine point nine million dollars. So one of the two senators from South Carolina stands before Republicans and says, "There's no racism. Black people survived slavery. We we didn't really survive uh, 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 LBJ's uh, the Great Society." Yet the man then says, oh, ain't no racism in America, and his own state HBCUs right here are owed $470 million. Yes. 
you know, I, I think I think often people do not take in. Well, one, I think people don't critically think enough. That's a real issue that I'm concerned about. But also, I think people don't. They think of racism as I treated you badly, or I hit you, or I, or they think of slavery as the race as racism. <laughs> they don't think of practices that are structural that makes it difficult for those who are socially constructed as black or brown um, or Latino, however people defi define themselves as being, and also they are put into this category of being undeserving, which has been a uh, reality for people since people were brought to the soil as enslaved people um, and denied the same privileges. And we see it a lot with even more recently was immigration practices directed at those who identify as Mexican. Um, we don't give people, we don't want to admit that we don't provide those same opportunities and that we don't want to admit historically the social networks that other people have been able to have with the Homestead Act, um, looking at the GI Bill, looking at redlining, looking at median income. Median income right now for blacks is $52,000 compared to whites is $75,000. And we've seen that historically, that those who are black have always been in a space where they have not had the same amount of income. We're not even talking about wealth, just basic income. Black people are getting paid 74 cents on the dollar to their white counterparts for the exact same job. So either we have decided that those who are black are lazy or they don't have the same ment mental capacity. And that's that's not true. When he brought up the whole idea that fathers are not involved, father black fathers were documented as being the most involved fathers by the federal government. They did their own study and proved that. So again, the devil's in the details, and read your history book. Read your own data but, that comes out of the government which you represent. Oh, but Dr. Pate, hold up. How about read your own history? <laughs> Tim Scott's daddy divorced his mama. Oh. Tim Scott's daddy divorced his mama, and he has talked about how his mama raised him and his brother as a working-class Poor woman. Go to my iPad. This is literally from Senator Tim Scott's own Facebook page. Listen. Senator has written a new op-ed published today in the Washington Post. It's titled, Abortion is Not the Way to Help Single Black Mothers. Senator Scott joins me now in an exclusive interview in Focus. First of all, welcome. Thank you very much. And I want to know what went through your mind as she was saying those words. Translate what you heard and why you felt, because it was very uncharacteristic to see you at times, just lean in so hard. Why did you feel like you needed to do it? I was compelled to do so, to be honest with you. I could not believe my ears. She was responding to a question, so it was completely unprepared, unfiltered. And her response was to, in my opinion, provide a calloused approach and a solution, a remedy for blacks living in poverty being abortion. And as a guy who was raised by a powerful, positive black woman in poverty, in a single parent household, I know that sometimes broken places is where you find brilliance. I know that sometimes hard work and dedication. Right so right there. So here's what's interesting. Lyndon Baines Johnson was pushed by the likes of Dr. King Congressman Adam Clayton Powell, Roy Wilkins, NAACP, Whitney Young, Urban League, Dorothy Height, uh, National C Council of Negro Women, so many other organizations, uh, uh, CORE, uh, SNCC, to confront poor in America. He complains about the Great Society and when they provided resources to single mothers where there was not a father present. And so he's criticizing that he's talking about his own mama. And the reality is, white women, poor white women benefited from this. And if you actually look at the stats, because you always had a lower rate of, of fatherless white homes, the data shows that white families, it tripled the number of fatherless homes in white America, in black America, it doubled. And so the reason I'm talking about this is because so many black folks, preachers and other politicians, throw this figure out, 73% 
of black families have no father in the home, and it's because of LBJ's great society where they gave checks to women and if there was no man at home. Yet these are the same folk who want to cut benefits, so I'm confused. If you're Senator Tim Scott and you believe that the great society was wrong for giving women greater benefits if a man wasn't present and saying, well, that ran the man out, well, they don't support give, keeping those, giving those benefits to the women if the man is still there. And so they trying to sit here and play the okie doke as if we don't understand what's going on here. You know, the thing about, and I, I appreciate your, 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 what you just said, too, because welfare, when it was first created, was an entitlement. The ADC program was an entitlement, and it was a response. 30 years before LBJ. Yes. Go ahead. And it was, it was a response, and it was, also, it was also a response to helping white women. And Social Security was a response to helping white families. So, and it was a response to helping white working families because blacks were not allowed to be in those positions where they had a government check, as my research participants will tell me, where they had taxes taken out because they were only allowed to have what was called menial jobs of being housekeepers and farmers, um, which was, and they were paid in cash. So that initial program was not meant for blacks. And that's, that's a, a misnomer, a miseducation uh, people don't understand. And then when it became available as an AFDC program, black women had to advocate to be on the programs. They were denied often access to those programs because they, and it was an entitlement for American citizens who were experiencing poverty, not because they were just trying to get over. They had to take care of their children and they could, and, and it was about the whole idea of looking at a benefit that was entitled to them. So this whole thing of looking at uh, uh, the father in the household and that's why fathers aren't there that was a policy that was developed in New York. It became more of a national policy and then became unconstitutional because the policy was an entitlement. And, and so anyway, it's just very frustrating because people don't understand history. They don't read and people need to read their history. But And also this whole idea of the welfare queen was a, a mythical person that was created by President Reagan. Hold up. Wait, wait, wait. Hold up. Stop. You mean the person where they were, whose library the debate was at last night? Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. I mean, uh, the, uh, the the woman, Miss Taylor, who was the welfare queen in Chicago, was someone who was a criminal. And people can be black, white, Asian and be criminals, but they decided to focus on this one white black woman as the image of what welfare became. And therefore, people have now since believed that there's more people, and you said it, more people are on welfare who are black. And the reality is there's more white people in this country who are poor, because there's more white people, and more white people were on welfare. And I think we don't, we, we, and that's just a simple reality. And see, I, I, we, and see, and see Doc, he, he, here's the thing that, that I, would, I would just love, because see, Tim Scott, he ain't coming back on this show, because uh, see, he, he barely wanted to come on my TV One show uh, because it's too much heat. This is what I would say to Tim Scott. Tim, why was your mama in poverty? Exactly what was happening in America where your mama was in poverty. Mm -hmm. And so here's a black man standing up. Oh, I was raised by a powerful single woman who was in poverty, working class, and me and my brother were able, they, 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 they saw the brilliant, first of all, it was a whole bunch of brilliant black people who were brilliant in poverty. But what a Tim Scott will never address is why his mama was in poverty. He won't address Jim Crow. He won't address that black folks were frozen out of many city, county, state jobs, federal jobs, frozen out of corporate America. Black folks who were brilliant minds, who were reduced to being janitors, uh, and, and uh, garbage collectors. He ain't gonna talk about what the garbage workers in Memphis were being paid when Dr. King went there in 1968. He's not going to talk about why folks were in poverty. He won't even address why there was a great 
society from President Lyndon Baines Johnson. He's not going to talk about before the very people there that the same person who they're praising Ronald Reagan was standing against selling homes to black folks in California. They ain't going to talk about any of that. Oh, I'm sorry. He ain't going to talk about redlining and that it was the realtor industry that created that which had a direct impact on black wealth. No, what they want to keep doing is saying how old oh, the Great Society was a failure. Well, if you gonna call the Great Society a failure, Doc, you got to call all of those government welfare programs that Franklin Delano Roosevelt created for white folks in West Virginia, Tennessee, Georgia, where they literally were funding stuff for them to build and was like, yo, just build some stuff because we gotta get these folks working. And it was white folks who were benefiting from that, and those white folks were able to get jobs. They were able to sit here and buy homes and get senior families to school. But it's amazing how we forget the white folks who got welfare, but he wants to focus on the black mothers who got checks on the LBJ. And that makes it, it just makes it easier for him because people believe that particular myth. Um, and they, but they don't want to look at historically what has been done for people like you just said. And I, I think it's unfortunate um, because we need to really get better at educating everybody, black and white and brown people, about how this country has really um, caused harm for some families and their ability to really move to a place of where they're financially secure and economically well off. Because it's, it's not because they're lazy. It's not because they don't want to work. It's because there have been purposeful practices that have been put into place that have not have allowed people to be all they can be, particularly those who are black and brown. And he's running around talking about the opportunity zones. When I had one of the preachers from Baltimore who was at the White House with him and Donald Trump, who came on my show the day they announced it, touting it, yet he came on the show six months later and said those same opportunity zones are an abject failure and not helping the people who are poor living in those areas. But then Tim Scott somehow was thinking that his opportunity zones are creating real opportunities for poor black folks right now, and we all know that's a flat-out lie. Yeah. The you know, other thing he said, too, that I, I thought was interesting, where he said capitalism is, a lot, is not alive and well, and we need to bring it back. Capitalism is definitely alive and well, and definitely working in the way that it's supposed to work um, with those, there are people who are very poor so that some people can be very rich. Um, that's the simplest way to look at it. But I, I just found some of his statements just to be just sound bites. They're not without any real substance to what is the reality of the world we live in. And the, real, the, the reality yep. of the world we live in is racism is alive and well. It's in the soil of where we are. But also, meritocracy is, is alive and well. And it works for some and not for others, based on the color of their skin and their gender and their sexualities in some cases, um, and how they, decide, they, 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 they tend to uh, define themselves. It's just unfortunate. And I can guarantee you uh, that all of mainstream media combined today will not spend as much time on this topic that we have. And that's also part of the problem because they ain't trying to have that conversation. I'm pissed. It's because, one, what I cannot stand are Negroes who stand in front of white folks mm. and do a dance. Mm. And it's a minstrel show. And they lie. Mm -hmm. what, what, what I can't stand is when they provide uh, comfort food to white conservatives who don't give a damn about poor people. And then when they continue to promote this lie, oh, the great society is what destroyed black families. They don't want to say, because, and then, then they create this, this mystique that, oh my God, Black America was so wonderful and it was perfect and it was these, uh, oh, these oases uh, of love and green grass and wonderful air. And yes, black folks in the midst of oppression, in the midst of pain, of degradation, had to fight and claw to create 
places that protected black people. But this idea that that was this wonderful life is absolutely nonsensical. And I love how they love, to, they, they love going from slavery to present day. <laughs> right. As if there was nothing that happened after the Great Compromise of 1877. Yeah, I mean, Tim Scott was up there just like a complete fool, spouting off white supremacist talking points, trying to make what has been systemic racism and oppression and violence and uh, just everything being thrown at Black people for centuries now into a matter of personal responsibility, into a matter of welfare queens and deadbeat absentee fathers. And it's just fucking ridiculous and it's offensive. It was ridiculous for him to say that Black people survived slavery? Like, casually, oh, Black people survived slavery, but, you know, welfare was a bridge too far for us. Like, this is so, so, like, disgustingly... I don't want to say the C word. I'm going to say just... I'm trying not to call them any kind of slurs, but... Well, no, 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 because I don't... First of all, you know, I, I don't... I, don't I know use, we don't do slurs. You know, I don't use it, though, but, but I'm going to you know, call it what it is, and that Thanks. is a lying, self-hating Black man. Yes, there we go. You put it better than I could without calling him a slur. <laughs> uh, so, but but you know what? What I really want to hone in though, um, Roland, is you know the Republicans, the Steve Bannons, and these other people have been talking about getting the black male vote, talking about how well Tim Scott, if he were the presidential nominee, he could you know knock off enough votes from Biden. I don't fucking think so. I don't think that black men listening to what Tim Scott had to say, throwing black men under the bus as being deadbeat dads who are the ruin of the black community, found anything appealing or attractive about what Tim Scott had to say or any of the people on that stage had to say about black people or about black men specifically. See, Lauren, this is why... And I need people to understand uh, this. My daddy texting me right now. Mm. I'm 55 next month. My brother 56 next month. My, my parents celebrated 56 years of marriage in June. So I ain't no black man. I ain't got no my daddy was never in my life story. Mm -hmm. I ain't got one of those. Right. My grandfather was married to my, mater my maternal grandfather was married to my maternal grandmother, I think it was 44 years. They lived eight blocks from me. So he died when I was 15. So the first 15 years of my life, I had my daddy, I had my grandfather, and my mama had four brothers. So I had uncles, black men who were... So all I saw growing up were married black men taking care of families. But even though I saw that, I need people to understand that uh, we were not poor, we were not rich. Mom and daddy never made in their life combined more than $50,000. I saw black people in Clinton Park uh, in Houston who were poor. I saw that. And so what angers me is when Tim Scott stands there and wants to assign blame to the great society when the Great Society, let me remind Tim Scott, was launched in broke-ass West Virginia, <laughs> where you don't even have 5% of black people. Ooh. Bill Withers is from there. T.D. Jakes is from there. You ain't got that many black folks in West Virginia. LBJ didn't launch it in the Mississippi Delta. He didn't launch it in the Black Belt of Alabama. He went to broke uneducated, no teeth, no health care, no jobs, cold field lung, West Virginia. And he stands there at the Reagan Library. And all these rich Republicans sitting here saying, say that, Tim. Yes, Tim. Yes, absolutely. Yes, Tim. We agree with you. And they don't give a damn about poor people when the same House Republicans advance a proposal this week that cut heating assistance, that cut nutrition to mothers and children, that cut 
Pell Grants. So, Tim Scott, don't you stand there and have the audacity to talk about the poor uh, and the money that went to them and fatherlessness when your own party today don't give a damn about poor people. Yeah. Well, Roland, I mean, to your point, your first point, uh, I feel the same way. Uh, anytime I hear these criticisms of black males, I always have to wince and think to myself that something is really wrong. My dad was uh, a huge provider, as were all my other male relatives uh, and my neighbors. And even now, you know, my black male friends, I mean, they're carting around their kids to sporting events. All of this bullshit stereotype that Tim Stop Scott put out there to please and comfort his white racist friends in the Republican Party is embarrassing. And it tells you something that he feels the need to be that person, always throwing black people under the bus. You know, I've never trusted anybody that hates the group that they are in. And of course, these Republicans, they need him for that messaging because, of course, they don't want to say it themselves. And the fact that the only black people that they like are the black people who hate other black people is a major tell, a major tell, mm -hmm. that he's standing on the stage talking about the great society somehow being harder than slavery, when we all know that the great society was, in fact, responsible for Head Start. One of the big, biggest success stories in the government is, in fact, Head Start, the Job Corps program, uh, obviously, 6465 LBJ signed the Voting Rights Act, uh, and also the Great Society improved uh, unemployment. Tim Scott has got to know that on some level. So I, I think a lot of his deception is actually deliberate. At first, at first blanche, I thought maybe this is just pure stupidity, but actually, I actually think some of this is very deliberate. On top of everything else, uh, I'm sure the two of you, Reese and Roland, have probably been to South Carolina. I've been to South Carolina because, of course, it's a major primary state. And I can yeah. remember the first time I went there in 2008, when Barack Obama was running for president, it is shanty-level poverty in some uh, places in South Carolina. It is the 10th poorest state in the United States. So, of course, we have to listen to Tim Scott say a bunch of bullshit. And then we have to realize that he has zero answers for the questions and the problems of poverty in the United States. He has yep. zero policy pollution uh, solutions for any of these types of things that he's talking about. And then he effectively lies about LBJ and black men. That is his contribution to the evening. You've got Vivek uh, Ramaswamy standing there, who is a full-on anti-black racist. You had uh, DeSantis standing there, who is a full-on anti-black racist. We just had a triple homicide, double homicide in Florida by some racist after all of DeSantis's rhetoric. Tim Scott doesn't light anybody up on that, doesn't bring any of that up. We had the nonsense curriculum problem in Florida. Tim Scott doesn't bring any of that up because Tim Scott is a delusional, self-hating uh, airhead. That's what he is. He's known for joking around about his socks with the cops on Capitol Hill. That's what he does. You know, he's cute, whatever. Every now and then cute. something will happen. Walter Scott got, you know, shot in the back by some cop. If you remember years ago, Walter Scott was murdered by a cop in South Carolina. And, you know, uh, Tim Scott and, and Lindsey Graham got all upset about it. And then, of course, that floats away. Tim Scott is a, he is a dangerously stupid person to say what he said last night. And, and that thing of what you said, Roland, at the top of your remarks with regard to black men and not taking care of their families, that is completely confusing to me and it will remain confusing to me because I don't know any black men that do that. I never have, starting with my father, <laughs> okay? And I just, I find him to be uh, deliberately, uh, it's, it's more than sort of self-hate, hate, hatred. There's just sort of that need, that deep need that Timmy has to be sort of flexing to white people in this way. And he did it again last night, and he will do it again. We're going to see this again probably at the next debate. So, um, for the audience watching, so let me, let me, let me explain something to y'all. So, when a Tim Scott complains about money coming from the federal government going to poor women and then saying that's what drove men out of the household. I, I want y'all to understand something. When the money goes from the federal government to the person in the state, 
the state then gets credited for federal government going to them. Go to my iPad. This is a story from March 2023. 2023's most and least federally dependent states. Let me scroll through. In order to find out exactly how big the difference in federal dependence is from state to state, Wallet Hub compared the 50 states in terms of three key metrics. Main findings. Y'all see that map right there? Y'all see um, the one right here? The one represents the folk who get the most money. That's the dark green. The lighter you go represent who gets the least money. Oh, what happens when we... So look at this map here. Y'all see little states and light, light, light. Then you see some dark. You see dark right there, dark there, dark there, dark there, dark, dark, dark. Huh. What we have in common? Southern states. So let's go right up. Look at this here, Kentucky. Look at this right here. Uh, let's go right there, West Virginia, South Carolina. Huh. South Carolina ranks number seven. So, Reese, out of the 50 states in America, 43 other states get less federal money than South Carolina, mm -hmm. which means it's a bunch of broke, poor, single women, a bunch of broke, poor men in South Carolina and all, he was in California. And it's blue states like California and Illinois and New York that send money to the federal government and get less back because it's going to broke states like South Carolina. Sure, that's what tripped me out too. Cause let's talk about nigga headed for two seconds. Cause she said, had the audacity to say that the red states were supplementing the blue states with uh, the SALT deduction. I think the hell not. As a matter of fact, we're, it's the other way around. And the Trump tax scam, which uh, Tim Scott bragged about all night, about how he got all these people tax cuts. My taxes went up. Hold up, up Reese. Reese, 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 we can help you out. Go to my iPad. Uh, 50 is New Jersey. 49 mm -hmm. is Washington State. 48 is Utah. Kansas, Illinois, California, Massachusetts, Iowa, Delaware, Nevada, Colorado, New York, Wisconsin, North Carolina, Nebraska, Ohio, Florida. It's a whole lot of blue states down there yep. that's not getting a lot of federal money. Nikki Haley, sit your ass down. And, and Tim Scott bragged about the bill all night. He bragged about that same bill that raised the taxes on us. And so I hope that people are paying attention across the board to the kinds of policies that they're bragging about, which were actually detrimental to most of the country that are not in red states and the kinds of things that they're trying to say they're going to do in the future. But I just want to say one more thing on Tim Scott because I think it's very funny that he got up there and talked about how America's not a racist country and there never has been and this is the best place for me and yada, yada, yada. But just last week, you were sitting up there crying because the white Republican donors wanted to know who your girlfriend was. And you tried to sit up there and say that because they can't talk about you being black, then they want to talk about you having a girlfriend or female girlfriend, as you put it. I don't think so, Tim Scott. Don't try to pull black people into your inability to answer questions about who your female girlfriend is, your Christian female girlfriend that you supposedly have is. Don't bring black people in it. The same way, don't bring black men into what has been systemic racism since slavery. Don't bring single black women into what's been systemic racism until slavery. Don't pick and choose when you want to see racism from Republicans or from this country, and you only apparently see it when it comes to you not, or maybe, who knows, having a girlfriend. And uh, to Reese's point, go to my iPad. Senator Tim Scott says people point out that he's single because they can't say I'm black. Well, Tim, who's people? 
because ain't, ain't no Democrats or progressives. They don't give a damn if you got a girlfriend or not. They ain't talking about that. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's your own party uh, who is sitting here uh, questioning whether you gay or not. Matt Schlapp was the one. Matt Schlapp, you know, the one who was who accused of grabbing a man's junk. Matt Schlapp Whoop. said if Tim Scott becomes vice president under Trump, he'll be America's first gay vice president. That's what your own white Republican, the head of CPAC, said, Tim Scott. And go to my iPad. He told the Washington Post, it's like a different form of discrimination or bias. You can't say I'm black because that would be terrible. So find something else that you can attack. Oh, now nah, you want to come to the cookout. Mm. Yeah, he, he wants to be black when he's black, and then he doesn't want to be black when he doesn't want to be black. You know, so when a U.S. Capitol police officer stops him in the hallway, then he wants to be aggrieved. And now with these donor questions, he wants to be aggrieved. But, you know, it was no different than what was asked about Lindsey Graham when Lindsey Graham ran. You know, when, when there's a single man running, they get asked these questions, or a single woman. Especially you by know, Republicans. I, Especially right. by Republicans. Right, especially with Republicans. So welcome to, to life running for, you know, president of the United States. Um, you know, Tim Scott, is, Tim, Tim Scott is just the quintessential thing that the Republican Party loves to promote, that Fox News loves to promote, self-hating black person. That's who they like. That's who they promote. That's who they amplify. So, so, um, so, so, so yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to button this up uh, this way. And I need everybody to understand something. I've had Senator Tim Scott on the show. I, was, I told y'all I was texting Senator Tim Scott about the George Floyd Justice Act. He only stopped texting me back when I jammed him up about what his own bill said that did not provide funding to the cops if certain laws were not passed. So I have no problem with Senator Tim Scott coming on this show, but he's going to have to answer the tough questions. The reason I am offended, the reason I am offended is because... What angers me is when individuals, I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat, stand before audiences and lie. My problem is the lying. My problem is when you want to assign what, hap what has happened in black families with single mothers to the great society, but your mama got divorced. Your mama was poor. Your mama raised you and your brother. So here's what Fox News would never ask, and if Tim Scott ever wanted to come on this show, I would ask him, Tim, did your mama ever get government assistance? If your mama got government assistance... Did your mama have a boyfriend? Did your mama consider getting married again? Did your mama have to make the decision that, well, if I get married to this man and he's making less than what I'm receiving, then that money gets cut out. We're going to have another mouth to feed in the household. That means less money. See, Republicans like Tim Scott don't want to deal with the very fundamental issue, and that is, if I am receiving support, why then can't we assist those uh, who are uh, already getting that particular money? And see, this is not new, what Tim Scott is talking about. This meme has been going around all the time. PolitiFact did a breakdown of a meme that was on Facebook that said, uh, that, uh, quote, go to my iPad, LBJ's Great Society Welfare System, 1964, 7% black children born without a father in the home. Post LBJ Great Society, the number is 73. Well, the folks at PolitiFact broke this whole thing down and then began to address the issue. Then they said the first option addresses birth. A key focus of this, they said, the figure ignores cases in which a couple isn't married but where the father is living in the home. Then they said right here, in 1964, according to federal health stats, 24.6% of births to non-whites were considered illegitimate, the term used for out-of-wedlock births at the time. In 2012, 
For blacks, it was 72. They said this is a large increase. The more recent figure is more or less on target. However, the starting point in 1964 is higher than the Facebook post suggests. It then lays out what the numbers are. Then it begins to say that the figures are also wrong. It then begins to talk about, according to Census Bureau data, 20% of black children in 1960 were living with just a mother. The comparable figure for 2013 is 50% of black children living with a mother only. Hmm. The measurement shows an increase, but the increase is two and a half times bigger, not 10 times bigger, as the mean says, and it's up by 25 to 30 percentage points rather than the 66 points cited in the memo. Oh, black families weren't the only group to see an increase in single motherhood over the same time period. It says right here, fathers, father, fatherlessness among whites still rose between 1960 and 2012. 6% of white children lived in a single mother household in 1960, a figure that rose to 18% in 2013. That's tripling the number. Folks, this is what you cannot do. You cannot get sucked into folk throwing out stuff and stats and ain't no backup. When somebody gives something to me, the first thing I say is, where'd you get it from? C can you send me a link? Can you send me backup? You got any receipts? What you got? Your opinion and your emotion cannot stand. So what bothers me the most with Senator Tim Scott is you want to have a conversation about black folk with non-black people. But the same Senator Tim Scott is afraid to come talk to black people. You don't see Senator Tim Scott talking to black-owned media. You know why? Because that ain't his Republican base. Senator Tim Scott right now, the reason he keep going on Fox News, because he's talking to white people. He's talking to white conservative people. He's talking to older white people. He ain't talking to us. And so I'm not going to give him a pass because he's black. You're not going to stand there and just say stuff and then not get fact-checked, Senator Tim Scott. But if you want to come home and have a conversation, you're more than welcome to come here. But my name ain't Harris Faulkner, and you can't feed bullshit to me and call it a five-star meal.